Our scripture this morning is found in Ephesians 5, 1 to 14. You can follow along in the screens or if you'd like, um, turn, turn to it in your, in your Bible. Ephesians 5, 1 to 14. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should, should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let, not, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Blessings to you, Linda and Hunter. Thanks. I guess at the children's time, I forgot. But I think there is space downstairs. Well, we'll call it children's church today. If anyone didn't send their kids down, um, they can. But it looks like we've probably done okay with that. So Danny is downstairs expecting if any kids feel like they need to come down. Rashard and I have a little bit of work to do. Linda, why don't you come on up? Linda Crockett is here. Oh, no, I'm going to forget. She is the director of Safe Communities, an organization focused on assisting churches and other organizations that uh, work with children in creating safe places, especially with consideration to uh, child abuse sexual abuse. So Linda was part of creating the safe church um, system that we have here to make this a safe place. I think you started that in 2011, and that has now become a nationwide program. It's been that well received and respected, and we are delighted to have you here with us this morning, Linda. So I wanted to just take a little bit of time to catch you up to speed on where we're at and what we have been, been working on. Um, for a good while, it feels like, maybe it's not been that long, we have been, as a church, sort of working through Ephesians. And we have been talking about the ways that God calls us to unity through Paul, who was working with the Galatians, trying to bring the Galatians into the Christian community. And he's given us some very challenging words. And sort of the first part started out with a sort of Paul's invitation to unity and what we have to do to live into unity. And then he started talking about the things that we need to remove from our lives to remove division and disunity. Uh, and I think, as Paul often does in his writing, he repeats himself. And this is, I think, what he does in, in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, follow God's example, walk in love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Again, Walk in love. Do the things that you need to do for unity. And we talked about it last week. We, I stole a phrase from Brene Brown, uh, author and uh, woman who studies shame, uh, who said that we need to have a soft front, 
That's the soft front, walk in the love of God. Just as Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, we too are to walk in sacrifice. Yes. Maybe sacrificing our right to be right sometimes, sacrificing uh, our right to know certain things, or sacrificing um, our fears in some ways, um, our soft front. But then he says, but among you, and he starts talking about the law. Last week we talked about the law. The law is a set of rules that have been given to us. If you look at those rules, they're all about unity again. Yeah. You know, don't steal from your neighbor. Don't uh, covet your neighbor's stuff. Um, love God and only the one true God. So we talked about that as being our hard back, soft front, hard back. It was a, an idea that kind of came through for people. So we see here again in verse 3, Paul talks, but among, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity of greed because there are, these are improper for God's holy people. Yeah. And, you know, it starts to lead into our discussion. One of the things that when I was studying this that struck me was the way that I think that humanity has a tendency to take something that was good, something that's designed for good. Uh, he talks about greed. Maybe we look at money. And I'm not necessarily sure, certain that in the Bible anywhere it ever says we were promised money, but God promised us blessing, shelter, food, and money is the thing that we use to get those things. Right. And so money is a gift from God, but yet somehow we humans take that and have turned it into an idol. Yes. Money becomes our way of getting to salvation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, maybe another thing is work. You know, we're supposed to work for six days, and work is a wonderful gift to us. And it's also something that we take and we turn it into uh, work is how we get God's grace, how we earn God's grace. Yes. Or work is how we develop our sense of significance. Mm -hmm. And so too... Sex. Thanks, Lyle, for breaking the ice. Um, I'm not going to say the word too many times. From here on out, I'm going to talk about it as being known in a biblical sense. Um, Abraham knew Sarah, and Isaac was born. But I actually even think the way that the Bible describes it is such a powerful thing. It is. It because is. Uh, to know another in such a deep way is such a gift that God has given to us, and it's about knowing someone physically and emotionally. And it's such a powerful gift, it's such an important gift, but that it's best if we know one another in a committed relationship, that which we call marriage in today's day and age. Right. But again, just like greed, just like work, we as human beings have taken this thing that is supposed to be beautiful and a wonderful gift and have defiled it. Yes. Uh, yes. Taking advantage of other people for our own desires to uh, fulfill our own desires, or even to just to hurt people, yes. or even because maybe it was done to us and we just don't know any better. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so my last thoughts on the Scripture before we bring you in, and I think it's a really wonderful segue, mm. I think. Um, it's kind of amazing, this Scripture, the way it fits with what we're talking about. I think it's, it's almost perfect. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just does things better than I ever could. Um, in Ephesians 5, verse 11, it says, Have nothing to do with the fruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful to even mention the disobedient, what the, dis what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Uh, one of the things about our sexual sin, I think, is that it tends to be something that's hidden. If you look at someone, uh, maybe, you know, think about it this way. If someone has cancer... You can look at them, and you may not even know that they're sick. You know, in the early stages, so we, might not even, we might not even know that we have it. We might not even know the way that it's impacting us. We're just tired. We just don't feel well. We just don't feel right. In, in, a, in a way, uh, it's as if we're dying inside, but we don't know why. And I think that that is what happens for people in the midst of sexual brokenness. And as Paul says, and even Jesus says, that we love to hide in the darkness, but it's time to expose and bring things to the light. I love that Paul says this in reference to an Old Testament passage. He says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on us as we confess, as we name, as we talk about these things. So I think with that, I will, I will say no more. That's why we're here this morning. I think, because of the Scripture yes. and the invitation mm -hmm. and all that's happening. So again, Linda, it's 
delightful to have you here. And I guess maybe the obvious first question is, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? What would you like us to know about your experiences or your, your background? Thank you. Um, that was such a beautiful way that you were describing the scriptures as an entry point to this conversation. So I am a survivor of child sexual abuse, and I'm also a professional in the field of trauma and recovery, but I'm also a mom and a wife and a grandmother and a person of faith who knows there are many survivors like me here today and in every congregation. I left um, a 20-year career in corporate finance after doing mission work with MCC and some other organizations in El Salvador. During the years of war there in the 1980s, when sexual violence was used as a weapon of war, as it often is. So as I worked with survivors of rape and torture, that really forced me to face what I had suffered as a child because like many survivors, I had numbed myself to my own pain. It was a transformative experience and it led to a long journey of healing from what I would now consider a hidden war zone inside my middle class, very religious home in rural Lancaster County, not far from here. But you know, Pastor Hunter, like 90% of abused children, I wasn't violated by strangers but by those within my immediate and extended family. I was actually hospitalized for six weeks when I was 12 as a result of the extreme abuse I suffered. And even though my medical records from that period showed that the doctors clearly thought it wasn't safe for me to go home, my pastor staunchly sided with my parents. He refused to believe that I was abused because my parents were in church every Sunday. They were involved in the community. He never once asked me, never. But I knew um, God had led me to El Salvador and helped me heal so I could help others. So I wrote about my experience in El Salvador and my own trauma in my book, The Deepest Wound, which has been out for some time and read now by people all across the world. I left the corporate world and I began a second career at Samaritan Counseling Center back in 2003 at the invitation of uh, Reverend Jim Hanna, who was the visionary founder of that center. I developed a program called Walking Together. It was focused on educating church and other leaders on how to recognize and respond to sexual and domestic violence. And you know, one of the reasons um, Jim Hanna remains a powerful champion for our work, and I would guess that some people here in the congregation may know or remember him, um, is that during the years he served as a lead pastor, he never preached about sexual abuse. And he only realized after he found it Samaritan that he had failed his congregations with his silence. And he deeply regretted that. And he wanted me to help churches bring this really uncomfortable issue into the light so we can be communities of hope and of healing for the, the victims among us. Could you talk a little bit about why you decided to start the Safe Church program in 2011? And how has your work changed Hmm. since that time? 
Well, in my early years at Samaritan, I did a lot of consulting with congregations after sexual abuse had occurred, often by a trusted church member. And the ripple effects often tore congregations apart as people took sides about who to believe and what to do. If the perpetrator confessed, which was rare, the victim and the family was often expected to forgive without any real accountability for the offender. So after I worked one heartbreaking case for two years where two trusted leaders in a church, in a rural congregation, molested a number of boys who only came forward years later as men, I knew I had to find a way to focus more on how do we protect our children, how to prevent this before it happens. So in 2011, I developed Safe Church, and God blessed the work, and we expanded. Um, We've worked with more than 100 congregations in Lancaster and nearby counties. We work in multiple states now. But as with all of God's creation, we're growing and changing. We've developed many more resources, for example, to support survivors and to help churches become safe environments for them, as well as protecting their children. And that's what we're doing here today. So fast forward, Jim Hanna is retired from Samaritan, and Safe Church actually outgrew its home there. And uh, we left with their blessing and formed a new nonprofit called Safe Communities, which I direct, and that includes our Safe Safe Church program and our Safe Places program, where we work with youth serving organizations, parents and kids, to prevent sexual abuse. Mm. So hmm. we've talked about how, how uncomfortable oh. this whole thing has kind oh, of made yeah. me. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I'm assuming there's a few out there that are slightly uncomfortable too. Yeah. So, you know, I guess one of the questions I have is why do you think it's so important that we talk about child sexual abuse like at, at church, in church? Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, because of its sheer scale. This may surprise you, but the most conservative research shows that one in four girls, one in six boys are sexually abused before they get to be 18. In a large scale study by the CDC of middle-aged or older, middle-class, mostly white Americans, 25% of the women and 20% of the men said this happened to them in childhood. Most had never told anybody. So survivors are all around us carrying invisible wounds, and many we find are leaving the church because their pain is not acknowledged. You know, we are able to acknowledge the pain of people suffering with cancer or addiction or the death of a loved one. Other survivors stay silent, but they do suffer in silence, and some have actually tried to talk to church friends about it, but they're often met with disbelief or judgment or told, well, why can't you just forgive and move on? This was so long ago. And so then they come to us at Safe Communities and they they ask, you know, why? in the church is it so much more about the comfort of those who haven't been abused than the suffering of those who have? And I don't have a good answer to that. And another reason that we need to talk, I think, is that child sexual abuse is fundamentally an abuse of power. When a person who is older uses a child for their own gratification or their own need, that's an egregious abuse of the power. And I think we're called by Christ to live with love and integrity in all of our relationships and to use the power we have for good, not for impurity, not for evil. So it's a theological problem. And I think rather than talking about sexual violence as an inappropriate 
conversation in church. We could even consider it an expansion of the theology of peace that is so rooted in your tradition and so beautiful. And so I would say then, how do we, peel, how do we apply that theology of peace? How do we light those peace candles? How do we apply that to our homes where violence and abuse of power is often well hidden? Why, I guess the question that keeps coming to my mind, um, and I think, it's, a, yeah, I think it's, it's just one of the, yeah, those thoughts we hear about something and it's like the first thought is like, why do children not tell someone um, what has happened to them? Why does it take so long or why do we not tell anyone at all? Yeah, delayed disclosure is very common. Most kids feel it's their fault. Often we don't teach them the proper name of their body parts or how to stay safe from sexual harm. And they don't even have language when they're little to describe what is happening to them. Children are usually hurt by someone they love and they trust. They are easily emotionally manipulated they may try to protect the perpetrator or their own family from finding out that a church friend or a relative or a babysitter has done this to them. In fact, studies show us that 90% of convicted child sexual offenders say they are very religious and they gravitate to churches. Some kids are told by the perpetrator, nobody will believe them. Or if they tell, Child Protective Services will take them away from their home. Some are threatened with physical violence. Kids have really good reasons for not telling people. And those who do sometimes aren't believed. They're punished, even though the statistics show us kids rarely, rarely lie about sexual abuse, even when they come forward as adults, when they have much more emotional strength, people doubt their stories. What do you see as some of the impacts in childhood survivors uh, for people that struggle with decades? Yeah, there's, um, the thing to understand is that sexual abuse isn't over when it's over. The impact can last for many years. It can show up as chronic medical conditions, um, addictions to drugs or alcohol to numb the pain, self-harming behavior such as cutting, not uncommon, along with eating disorders, Survivors are at a significantly high risk of suicide as they age because the pain just won't go away. They don't view the world as a safe place or most people as trustworthy. As many as 50% develop PTSD. That's a higher rate than soldiers. And then they have all the related problems with concentration, memory, flashbacks, nightmares, insomnia, holding down a job, relationships, trust, intimacy, the list just goes on and on. And finally, there's a huge, huge spiritual impact. Some survivors lose their faith in God. Questions that they bring to us are ones like, where was God when I was raped? Why didn't God protect me? They need to be able to bring these to the church, to their pastors, to people here in this community. But they often do feel defiled and broken inside, certainly not beautiful anymore as we sang this morning, even though on the outside they may look like they have it all together. So I guess maybe the question then is what do we as a church, how can we as a congregation help? What do we need to do? Exactly. We begin by what we're doing today. We talk about the issue openly, but today should be the beginning 
of the conversation, we all in the church need to be better educated about sexual abuse, how it happens, why it happens, the spiritual impact. We can't protect children we love or help people heal from what we don't understand and can't talk about. And I don't think there's any better education for this than the church, because we can bring our faith into that. We also, we really need to be sure that our response to a survivor does no harm. Mm. You know, our words, even if they're well-intentioned, can hurt when we're uninformed. And so we've prepared a two-page congregational guide to help everybody have conversations about this issue here at church. We have a resource sheet. All right. And I think they'll be out. They're on the table yeah. in the back. Yeah, there's a resource sheet. If we run out, we can make more. We can make more. Great. With... Um, books you can read to educate yourself more, including books written by pastors and theologians about the issue. There's some counselors listed there, resources for survivors who are local, and that's really important, but we need to understand it takes more than therapy to help somebody heal. It takes a community of people to come around you and love you and support you to heal. And we also, we need um, groups for people who are healing from sexual abuse, just like we might have groups for people who struggle with alcohol or are grieving. When we have those kind of ongoing ministries for survivors and with survivors, that tells them the church cares about this. And then finally, we need sermons preached from time to time about this issue and how it's not God's will that people are hurt by domestic or sexual violence. We need prayers offered out loud for the many survivors among us, and we don't even know who they are. We need um, to clearly say to them, this was not your fault. We need calls to confession and repentance by those who have offended. This is how we create a safe environment in a faith community. So what will uh, your organization be offering? What will safe communities be doing here? Mm -hmm. How are you helping us? What's it gonna look like? Yeah, well, the first step is breaking the silence, which we're doing today. 10 straight sermons. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll go slowly here. Okay. Uh, we'll go slowly, but then on October the 13th, we'll have a workshop after church for all the adults in the congregation to learn more about this, to be educated about it. I think there's a lunch provided, um, and I promise we'll be out of here no later than two, because I know there's football on Sundays. <laughs> Many people will be uh, wanting to, to go and see, but two at the latest will be out of here, so you won't miss too much of a one o'clock game. That workshop would be for anyone, right? Anybody. I mean, that would be an understanding that, that each and every one of us, probably whether we know it or not, knows someone exactly. who is a survivor. Yes, yes. That would be there to teach us how to talk to people, how to walk with people. Exactly. Okay. How do we talk to people? How do we accompany them? How do we support them? So that's what this workshop is about. Um, and then on November the 9th, we're gonna hold a, a retreat here, that's a Saturday, for uh, survivors of sexual, other violence in childhood, domestic violence. And we're gonna focus that retreat on the story of Tamar. Tamar is the daughter of King David, who was raped by her half-brother. And um, that will run, I think, from 8.30 to 4.30 here at the church. And any adult survivors are invited to come to bring friends with them and spend a day um, giving voice to our sister Tamar and finding our own voices through scriptures and prayers and reflections. And then on January, we're going to start on January 9th, we're going to start a six-week healing group for survivors called 
Circle of Hope. We'll meet every other week here at the church in the evenings, and we'll begin by talking about how we experience the holidays. They're hard for survivors. Many survivors have interactions with family members who hurt them or still don't believe them. And so we'll create a healing circle that we hope will continue to flourish long after the six weeks ends. So that's what we'll be offering. Okay. Linda, I think that's what we had to say. So I think I'm mm -hmm. going to say thank you. Thank you. And maybe I'll close this time with a little prayer. That'd yeah, okay. that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Heavenly Father, I, I, I remember a place in the Bible, a scripture, where you say that we will face many trials and tribulations, and yet you have the victory. Lord Jesus, I praise you for your words. We don't necessarily understand, and maybe we won't, until we meet with you again, all of the brokenness in the world that we live in. Some of this stuff is just so hard for us to wrap our, our, our heads around or to, to understand how people could hurt others like this. Maybe for some it's wondering how they could hurt someone like this. And maybe for others it's how someone could hurt them in this way. Lord, we don't understand. We don't understand, but we turn to you. Lord Jesus, in the midst of all of it, you who are with us, you who have mercy, you who are the great physician, you who are the healer, you who are filled with love and grace, we turn to you. Lord, we don't even know what this looks like completely going forward, but we know that you will be here. And I pray that you will lead us, and I pray that you will guide us. And Lord Jesus, I praise you, praise you, praise you for every person here today. And I pray that your spirit settles upon us and leads us. We pray that you'll guide Linda as she works with our congregation and helps us to be a congregation of healing and hope. And Lord, lead us. Give us boldness. Give us strength. Give us courage. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And as I guess as Linda heads back to her seat, Linda and I head back to our seat, and Richard comes up to lead a song, I would just say that um, after the service, um, Linda and Nana Sue are going to be in the gathering room, and I believe Dwight's going to be in his office, and I will be in my office. We're not going to stand at the back of the door. Um, we're going to go to those places, and if there's anyone that wants to come for prayer or just to talk to us about anything, um, we will be there, um, sort of in those quiet places for you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you.